the commentary that you've passed on the LIBOR scandal and the role of traders? Yeah, so um, in the wake of the LIBOR and Euribor scandals, there was quite a lot went on um, from the regulatory point of view in investigating this. And, and the Wheatley report, for example, was, was very important there. And what um, it seems to me, though, that Wheatley missed an important part of the picture. Um, so uh, forensic psychologists who are interested in the, um, uh, the psychology of fraud note that there are three kinds of conditions that are all important for uh, fraud to take place. The first is um, a, uh, the, op the opportunity for fraud, um, the um, lack of um, suitable guardians, or the lack of competent guardians. Um, and then the third is a, suit, a, you know, is a, 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 a suitable supply of offenders. Um, Aren't one and two the same? No, well, I'll come on to that in a minute, because um, what Wheatley looked at was the issue of guardians, you know, appropriate rules and appropriate monitoring. Um, they also looked at this question about the availability of opportunities uh, for fraud. Um, but this supply of motivated offenders um, it w was was not really featured, and I think it's really important. So, so what? Why, why is the supply of motivated offenders really important? Well, it turns out that actually, in fraud, the supply of motivated offenders is really genuinely a limiting factor. Because here's the thing: um, if I'm going to look you in the eye and successfully pretend to be your friend, or at least well disposed towards you, whilst all the time meaning to do you harm, that's quite hard psychologically, and the the number of people who, who, who've got that capability is quite small. Um, those that do it well, anyway, tend to have to rely on certain distancing strategies. You know, so one of the ways uh, fraudsters typically manage that kind of emotional distancing from the, the harm they're doing to their victims is to have various ways of seeing their, their victims. They talk about them as suckers or they, you know, they had it coming because they're just greedy. You know, lots of frauds depend on playing on people's greed. Um, it turns out to be quite an effective strategy, but I suspect sometimes it's also um, an effective strategy because it means that the, the, uh, the fraudster is able to say to themselves, well, they had it coming. Now, um, however, in our age of um, the internet, uh, fraud is becoming much more common. One of the reasons, I think, is that the supply of motivated offenders is increasing because um, the internet itself provide, it provides an immediate distancing strategy. You know, especially when you're doing bulk emails and so on, you don't actually have to have anything to do with the, uh, the person directly. And by the way, you know, professional criminals are doing um, uh, this you know, as, as big business and they, they'll set up um, uh, call centres and the people in the call centres don't actually know that they're involved in a fraud half the time. So that provides further distancing. Um, so how does that, how, how's that relevant to the trading situation? Um, well, first of all, um, traders are very easy, easily able to see this as um, a victimless crime. If we're talk about, talking about um, fixing the LIBOR rate, um, you know, one of the things they're able to say to themselves is, well, for every winner, there's a loser. You know, so I'm just changing who the winners and losers are. It's, you know, the, on balance, it's doing no harm. Um, but the, the second is actually to think about um, the um, adverse impact of um, uh, trader bonus structures. Because uh, here's the thing, trader performance is fairly loosely coupled to their skill. There's a relationship, but there's a massive amount of noise in that relationship. So what does that mean? It means, first of all, that early on in their careers, people who aren't that good can get very lucky. Um, and they can start to build up a bonus on that basis. And they start to find it's impossible to sustain, by which time they've got all sorts of sunk costs in terms of their you know, investments in a trophy wife or um, a school for the kids or the yacht that they're trying to maintain. Or, um, and so that can produce a great deal of pressure to find ways of keeping up performance. Uh, the second is, of course, that um, good traders can have long runs of bad luck. One of the really revealing uh, bits in our study where we looked at traders' heart rate and we're looking at their stress levels and so on, um, 
is that we had one uh, very experienced trader um, who for some reason, you know, unlike all the other traders, uh, was most stressed when the markets were quiet. And this was so different, you know, it was standing out so much on the charts that I thought maybe there was even something wrong with the equipment. So I went and had a chat with him and asked him about this. And he said, I can tell you straight away what that's all about. He said, it makes entire sense to me. He said, I'm missing my targets at the moment. Um, and uh, I'm really worried I won't make my bonus at the, uh, at the end of the year. Um, and if the market's quiet, I've got no earning opportunities. Um, and the thing is that when the markets are quiet, I feel a lot of stress because I'm tempted all the time to try and trade despite the fact there isn't an opportunity. And, and actually stopping myself trading while it's quiet is, is really stressful. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting. So I think, you know, there's, there's lots of reasons um, why uh, the way in which traders are rewarded mean that they can be under intense pressure uh, to meet targets. Um, and we also know from a lot of research on, um, on these kinds of performance-related pay is that performance-related pay is quite good at motivating effort, uh, but it's not really good at making people, tr making people work smarter. Um, so it can, it can be, um, uh, certainly for some people, um, and you know, some people are more stress resilient in these kinds of settings than others. For some people, it can be a source in itself of considerable stress and, um, and create uh, some degree of performance detriment. So you'll always have some proportion of traders whose performance really isn't hitting targets for reasons that are not well coupled to their own levels of skill. And that produces quite intense pressure on these people to find ways of bringing their performance up. You know, in those circumstances, it's very easy to having found that you can earn by bending the rules once to start to make a habit of it. So, they're not necessarily dishonest, and they're easy persuaded because of the pressure. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so I guess, you know, when, when I started looking at, the, you know, that, the LIBOR uh, issue from the a psychology of trading point of view, you know, it, one of the things that struck me is a lot of the press comment was along the lines of, you know, traders are just naturally crooks. And actually that wasn't my experience. You know, um, most of uh, the traders we interviewed actually quite a big focus on, on, you know, certain forms of integrity anyway. Um, and um, in terms of personality types, um, fairly normal range of personality types, except that on average um, our findings on personality were that traders tend to be a little bit more risk averse um, and um, a, a little more introverted than your average member of the population.